So I wanted to kind of take a little different perspective. It's been interesting being uh, one of the clinical oncologists who were in the room and someone who was treating patients up until a few years ago and to hear the comments. And how could you not love Amy's presentation? But I will tell you that Amy, for me, represented more than two standard deviations off the mean of the patients that I treated in terms of her involvement and her knowledge, and you're here now. Um, and so I, I often think about kind of how do I get to that mean? How do, I t how do I address the issues that are affecting the patients who are around the mean and not the patients in the standard deviation space? And I'm concerned today that we maybe have gotten too focused on the two standard deviations off the mean and not the mean. I'm gonna try to give you some input as to how I think we have to go about the mean, and that relates in a way, both in terms of patients and in, the, in their providers, how pathways may play a role. So we're all here kind of because of this slide in terms of the crisis in the delivery system of, of cancer care in particular, cancer disease of aging. We've got an aging population. We've got increasing incidence. And we've got greater complexity, greater chronicity, all the things that have come up in the discussion so far. And we've addressed this issue nice little graphic from the New Yorker, but innovation comes at a cost. And we don't want to necessarily remove innovation from the process, but it adds to this kind of perfect storm of increasing innovation at increasing cost at a time of increasing incidence, um, and how do we find a solution to that? So, so one of those potential solutions that's been posed is the solution, can pathways be one of those methods to try to control that? And so you may be familiar with many of the pathway companies. This was just an attempt to kind of summarize the major players. And if you look at them at 10,000 feet, and I would suggest you look at them even at 10 feet, they will look identical to you, which is problematic if you're in that business because um, it would suggest that, you know, if you're all the same, then it's a, basically a crapshoot if you want to pick one. But they're all using some sort of consensus-driven pathway. It's based upon evidence. Um, variance is going to be decreased by a result of that restriction, and where there is decreasing variance, there is decreasing cost. So what I would suggest, though, that when you get a little closer, and sometimes, I don't suggest it needs a microscope, but it does require really looking a little bit more deeply than one might just by looking at the website for the respective companies, that you could start to see those differences. So what I would say makes us different for the cardinal pathways is that we have validated savings against multiple cancers. So it's not a single cancer type, and it's not a single cancer practice, even if it's a large practice. But can you take that program, can you take that program, implement it across disparate providers, solo and group practices, affiliated, non-affiliated, staff physicians and fee-for-service physicians, all the different GPOs that they're using as their buying source, can you implement that kind of a program? And can you do it in breast cancer and lung cancer and colon cancer and beyond. Do you have direct physician engagement? Is it a recipe book? Because most professionals that I know of any stripe, when given a recipe book, they tell their response is usually defensive. Don't tell me how to do what I do. I'm a professional. Difference about engaging. Engaging is here's all the information. What do you glean from that information and how might we work, how might we work together to create that more restrictive care plan? Are you measuring compliance? Is your in or your out? Or is compliance more discreet in which you look at specific measures of compliance, the low-hanging fruit elements? Can you provide them the technology resources in order to allow that interaction time to be under two minutes, preferably 90 seconds? Because once that doctor typically sees an hourglass or a pinwheel that spins for more than a second and a half, you're done. And then can you gain information from the experience and the observations that can inform what you're doing so you can evolve the process over time. Those are the things that I believe we're doing that set us apart, and I'm just sharing that with you because I think that when you do look at the whole space, you really want to be able to look at each of the individual providers and what makes them different. What is their raison d'etre? What is their approach? What is their philosophy? So what influences my philosophy and how I'm developing our program is really the statement. It's behavioral economics of medicine. And it's interesting to me when I come and speak to a group like this because I've got economists in the room. You know, I, I don't have any behavioral psychologists I have, but um, I'm somewhat stepping out of my comfort zone. But this is the result of what I've been doing over the last 25 years. I ran a practice that I started solo. It grew to 46 physicians with 29 locations, 36 mid-levels, 500 staff. And what it became 
by the time I left the practice in 2010 is I felt like I was no longer a practicing oncologist. I was a public health doctor because we were looking at so many patients and we had to deal with standardization of care as much from our perspective then for liability reasons as for anything else. So if you think about the behavioral economics of medicine and we look at the Institute of Medicine report and some of the other reports that have been published and even the op-eds by Zeke Emanuel um, and the 20 other doctors who co-signed it, what you would come away with is there seems to be a dogma that's been espoused about how we're gonna control the cost, what we have to change. And I thought I could distill them down to four points. Pay for value, not for volume, which assumes you can define value, and that value is defined the same for all the stakeholders. Ensure a physician's core competency in evidence-based medicine, which is kind of scary in a way because it suggests that physicians are not competent um, currently, or if they are competent in, in evidence-based medicine, they're not following the evidence. And the question that would be provoked is, why would they do that? And then patient-centered care, fully informed, shared decision-making. I believe I was the first large practice leader in the country to hire a palliative care doctor. I hired a palliative care doctor in our practice in 1996, and I made her chief operating officer in 1999. We started our own hospice. We had our own palliative care team made up of six certified social workers. And what I learned from that experience, and my wife likes to tell me, she's now actually getting her public health doctorate, is education doesn't change behavior. And we think about the great things that have happened in public health, seatbelts, smoking cessation. It's happened because of the financial pieces, often the penalties, the carrots and the sticks, which were aligned. It's because click it or ticket. It's because of taxation of tobacco as much as it was the education. So education by itself for me is problematic without a more comprehensive approach. And I am very concerned about the ability for the vast majority of my patients who did not have Amy's background, her intelligence, her knowledge and, and loving to surf, who were able to distill the information that many of my doctors are struggling with interpreting and being able to convey that in a meaningful way that really allowed them shared decision making. And lastly, the health information technology that we just heard so much about that's so problematic because we are working in medicine with a health technology platform that was developed in the 80s and in all our aspects of our life, we work with health information technology that was developed after 2010. And that disparity in health information technology is so problematic for us to advance our field. So this was referenced, actually, Amy referenced the Temple slide or the Temple article from New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and this is what can be done in terms of a survival benefit from early palliative care versus standard of care. And I would tell you that I think all the oncologists in my former practice were familiar with the article. They knew the slide. It wasn't an, a lack of understanding of the evidence, but it was one piece of evidence. And interpreting that evidence and incorporating that evidence into their practice, I don't believe was unique to the doctors in my environment. In fact, I would suggest that if you look at the article by Nancy Morden from Health Affairs in 2011, that in now was it not unique in my practice experience, but rather it was the uniformity, the standard that exists within our field. Most influential piece that I've ever read uh, in all my time in medicine, um, mostly because of its size and scale. So if you're not familiar with it, just a quick summary of it. Um, Morden's group looked at 200 plus thousand Medicare beneficiaries with cancer and looked at the resource utilization in the last year of life and then grouped those patients because of certain assumptions going in that the site of care in which they received their care could influence the resource utilization. And so as you go across the x-axis to the top, we have the various sites of care from NCCN comprehensive cancer centers to other comprehensive cancer centers to academic hospitals to community hospitals and then bed size less than 150 to greater than 300 and for profit, not for profit. And in every category, the numbers are just striking. When you go through the y-axis and look at the resource utilization measures, the uniformity is absolutely striking, as is the tragic nature of the results. Only 50% or so of the patients are being referred to hospice, and worse, the average length of stay is eight days. Now, when we look at other aspects of resource utilization, two-thirds are being admitted to the hospital in the last month of life for an average of six days. 
A quarter are being admitted to the ICU in the last month of life for a couple days. And only about five or six percent actually get chemotherapy in the last weeks of life. I read that and I thought, oh my God, this is completely opposite of everything else that I've been hearing. If there's this kind of data available, how do we get back to those dogmatic statements about pay for value, not for volume? If there is an, our, an economic Darwinism that we are all a part of and we all will behave in our economic best interest, then why are these doctors who are all salaried behaving in the same way as these doctors who were for profit and working in community hospitals. Because from an economic best interest, that salaried physician would be doing as little as possible, get that patient to hospice early. I don't want to see him every week in the clinic. And from a standpoint of these doctors, you would think that they may be treating to the last week of life with chemotherapy, and yet we don't see it. So it was challenging to me because there's data that exists, and we don't seem to be responding to that data. So, when the data was updated in the Dartmouth Atlas just recently, it was really great to see that the most favorable variance was the fact that deaths in the hospital were going down. It was the most single piece of favorable evidence, down 14.4%. But at the cost of a 31% increase in patients with a three-day hospice stay. I will tell you as someone who did oncology patient care for 25 years plus years, there is nothing worse you can do to a patient or a family then when they are in the active process of dying, take them and their family and move them out of that hospital bed and move them somewhere else so they can die a day later. All that had to be done here in these patients was basically to accelerate care in the hospital and let them go peacefully. And so if I look at the negative metrics here, ICU days are up, patients admitted to the ICU are up, we're not progressing. Despite the fact that we go ahead five more years and with all the knowledge we have, with the number of palliative care specialists that are in every one of those institutions that are a part of these, inst these centers that all have palliative care programs in their hospitals, not seeing improvement. In fact, we're going the wrong way. So I thought about how does this influence what we do programmatically? So one, I need the doctors to be engaged. I need them to buy into the program, which means they've got to perceive they're independent. They are making their own independent clinical decisions. We can facilitate those discussions. As Lee said, we can provide the data to help them make those decisions, but they need to make those decisions. They've got to buy in. Number two, there's got to be collaboration, collaboration between the payer and the provider, whether that's in financial incentives or just the willingness to sit at the table together and listen. And then you can't set compliance at a threshold that's going to jeopardize outcome. Compliance is set at 80% so that at any time, the physician can, will not feel impel, compelled to provide a therapy that they believe is not in that patient's best interest. Pathways are just a, a narrowing of the universe of care. They're not an alternative universe of care. So we validated. We went out and we looked for a third party Milliman to do an actuarial methodologic analysis of our savings. And this was in our very first program. And what we found was we talked about the triple aim. In this case, our triple aim is a little bit different, but patients had better outcomes from outcomes that we can measure in this kind of programming. They had lower rates of ER visits, lower rates of hospitalization, a 7% overall decline in hospital admissions. There was a 15% savings to the health plan, and the doctors actually were reimbursed higher for participating. Amazingly enough, the incentive for the doctors was a higher reimbursement on brand drug, and yet they use less brand drug. Challenging again, these notions about what is driving the care. So that led into the next experiment. This was a pilot program with those same physicians in a subgroup, and this program was a medical home in which we were going to take the money from drug reimbursement and move it into professional fees. Aggregate increase in professional fees was overall across the board about 166%. And the drug, uh, were, the, the doctors were offered to white bag their drugs, as you might imagine, 33 physicians, 13 practices. None of them accepted that. Even though they were at risk on drug, 
because although ASP was set at ASP plus eight, because specialty pharmacies can't purchase drugs as inexpensively as doctors, so that was the best specialty pharmacy offer, the ASP recalculation was only going to be done annually, which meant drug increases over the course of the year could put the doctors underwater on drugs in the third and fourth quarter of the program, but the mitigating factor could be the, gene the brand to generic changes over that same time period, and so it was going to be a bit of a crapshoot. The doctors were at risk. So they could be at zero risk and take the drugs in a specialty pharmacy white bag, or they could assume risk and stay with their buy and bill. They all stayed with their buy and bill. So you would think then, we now have a pretty interesting control group. We've got the doctors, 185, who stayed in the first generation program, reimbursed at ASP plus 24.5 for their brand drugs, and on an aggregate ASP plus 300 on their generics. And look at the behavior difference when the other doctors were at basically no margin on drug, but pay two and three times their E&M codes. You might think they'd see the patients more often. Maybe they would give less drug. Maybe they would give less brand drug. And yet when we compare the first generation program in the prior year to the year of the, pro to the, year of the implementation and the medical home to the year, we don't see any change in the medical home or in the control when it comes to established patient visits. Despite getting paid three times more, they didn't see the patients any more frequently. When we look at those who received chemotherapy, although the medical home doctors gave maybe a little bit less chemotherapy, no real change in chemotherapy administration in the year. When we look at chemotherapy administrations per patient, again, although a slight increase, they were seen in both groups and it was matched. And when we look at generics, there was a fairly dramatic increase, but again it was matched, and that was the result of Gemzar and Taxotere both going generic in the same year. We saw no statistically different behavior, despite the fact we totally changed the reimbursement model. So we just asserted that pay for value, not pay for volume, is going to be the driver, and yet we just did an experiment and that didn't work. Why? NCCN guidelines controlling care, their pathway providers for two prior years, they were already into a pattern of care. Not sure what the reasons are, and we're studying that, but the reality is a major reimbursement reform didn't change behavior. So if it's not the pay for value, it's the evidence issue maybe. What if, how do we study the evidence? So this is another program that we did. And in this case, what we're looking at is these are doctors, A through Y. They're in a single large practice environment. We're looking at the utilization of Oncotype DX in their breast cancer patients, stage T1, T2, N0, ER positive, HER2 negative. The red represents the number of eligible patients that they saw, and the blue lines represent the percent of those patients who received Oncotype. And the obvious, there's no correlation. It's not as if patients, it's not as if doctors who see many more eligible patients are more likely to know the evidence and use the test more appropriately. And it's not as if doctors who see a lot of patients will necessarily do the test. We have doctors who saw over 50 patients who were eligible and used the test basically zero. And we have doctors who see 10 or 20 patients, 30 patients, and do the test 70% of the time. They all see the same evidence. They're in the same practice environment. They practice has a pathways program. Oncotype DX is part of that pathways program and yet we see such divergent behavior. How do we explain it? So I will tell you that you've got 99.5% of climatologists who believe there's global warming, there's climate change, and yet 40% of Americans don't believe it. So we had this amazing capacity to use cognitive dissonance to find that one piece of evidence that supports our worldview. And I will tell you that we met with the doctors to review the program. I have an op-ed from 2002 called Oncotype Concept into Question, there it is, one piece of evidence. 99 pieces of evidence that this is the way that care should be done, part of every major guideline. I've got an op-ed here. So I would argue that this is not necessarily a performance issue that's related to value versus volume. It's not a reimbursement problem. And I'm not convinced it's an evidence problem. What I do believe, it's a cultural problem. And our culture of medicine impacts our doctors and it impacts our patients. And if we don't get to the culture of medicine issue, 
then we're really ignoring the elephant in the room. It's a culture of medicine which embraces now over later, new over old, and more over less. Is the problem the PSA test, or is the problem what's done with the result? Is the cost the $10 for the PSA, or the cost of all the care that's not evidence-based, that's driven by patients who are not going to live with prostate cancer cells in their body, and doctors who are feeding off that desperation as well as their own interpretation of that one op-ed that says maybe there's that patient who would die if I didn't treat. How do we change that? From a pathway perspective, what you can do is you can start to focus and challenge some of these notions, but in a more focused and strategic way. First, restrict the pathway compliance to the 20% of diagnosis that are 80% of the spend. Do you really need pathways for every diagnosis under the sun? Or do you want to focus on breast, colon, and lung in a minimum? For commercial, it's two-thirds of spend. And maybe add prostate and ovarian, if it's Medicare, and take you to 80% of the spend. And really focus on five malignancies, rather than going to everything under the sun and have mesothelioma and you know, name your cancer. Focus on behaviors with the greatest impact on cost and quality. Number one for me is single agent sequential therapy in patients with advanced metastatic disease. Two thirds of all the programs that we start, what we will see, two thirds of the doctors and all the programs we start are giving complex therapy in third line of metastatic care. Once we implement the program, that cuts in half. Engage physicians intensively, but that's choosing those battles wisely. Do I want to fight over every issue or every drug and regimen they're going to pick? Because if I can get them to adopt single agent sequential, I can have a greater impact in total cost of care and decreasing acute care interventions than I can have by removing dozens of drugs from the armamentarium. Provide patient education in real time. You can give a doctor a code. You can pay them $250 to have a conversation. Do they know how to have the conversation? Are they comfortable in having the conversation? Sure, they can create a macro statement, click a button on their EMR, and have that statement embedded into the medical record. But what was the conversation that took place? and then provide the health information technology solutions that allow them to do some of these things in real time. So this is how we're moving forward, and it's just one example of one pathway and program and one approach, but it's using our own data and data that's been published in order to inform our decisions to allow us to evolve in order to address the concerns which we're hearing about today in a very pragmatic way that we can implement now. Thanks.